Welcome everyone who's joining us today. At this point, I would like to invite the panelists to turn on their cameras. And while they're doing that, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items with those of you joining us. Please note that video is disabled and microphones are muted for all attendees to ensure a smoother experience. We will be recording the session and it will be made available on our MIT Sloan alumni YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And we have a packed conversation today, but we are going to do our best to, at the conclusion, take a few questions from our viewers. You may type those into the Q&A panel in the Zoom interface at any point during the session. And now it's my pleasure to turn the session over to Dean Schmidtlein to begin. Thank you. And welcome everyone. Uh, I'm especially grateful to our three alumni uh, panelists and speakers this afternoon. Um, you know, as we look at uh, the extraordinary challenges and some opportunities in this time, we thought it might be useful to look back at the 2008-2009 economic recession um, and to uh, speak with some alums who came out of the MIT Sloan School during that time uh, and uh, navigated their own um, somewhat different paths um, in the immediate uh, future after graduation and, of course, in the medium term as well. Um, it's been suggested that all crises are distinct and in some ways they are. They start in different ways, they last different amounts of time, they end in different ways, but in other respects crises tend to have some similarities. They ask for adaptability and resilience um, and they challenge people with respect to the short and sometimes medium term goals that it would be great to pursue. And so we are hopeful that this afternoon's opportunity to chat uh, will help uh, with uh, information uh, and be engaging um, and maybe in some ways inspiring as well. So I'd like to introduce our three panelists. First, Kelly Courtney is a graduate of the Sloan Fellows class of 2008. Kelly is a communications and business professional with over 20 years working at the intersection of industry, government, and academia with a specific focus on the innovation economy. She's led high profile initiatives with major policy implications and has worked with Fortune 500 executives, investors, government officials, and major universities, including happily MIT. Kelly, thanks very much. Frederick Karest, um, is also a panelist this afternoon. He received his MBA from MIT Sloan in 2009. Frederick is the Executive Vice Chairman, Chief Operating Officer, and co-founder of Okta, based in San Francisco. Frederick co-founded and co-hosts as well the award-winning Zero to IPO podcast, featuring Silicon Valley founders and investors and entrepreneurs sharing insights from their experiences building businesses. Frederick also serves on the um, Executive Advisory Board for the Martin Trust Center for MIT uh, Entrepreneurship, and he also advises early stage software companies. Frederick, thank you as well. And last but not least, David Manicheri also graduated with his MBA in 2009. Dave is an investment advisor in the Washington DC office of Goldman Sachs, where he advises private companies, pension plans, entrepreneurs, and nonprofits on both illiquid and liquid investment management and asset allocation. While at Sloan, he was awarded the Martin Trust Fellowship and Achievement Award for Leadership. Recently, David has served for four years as a board member for the Alumni Advisory Board for the MIT Sloan School. David, thank you for that, and thank you also for joining us. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to our panelists and begin asking our questions. Um, and as you know, we are going to try to preserve time for the audience um, to submit questions and have them answered a little bit later on. Um, you know, as we begin, uh, we have a little bit of a focus maybe on that 2007, uh, 2008, 2009 time period. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of what you were doing before you came to MIT Sloan, what your hopes were during your time as a student, and then how that transition to the post-student experience um, uh, went for you um, in the short and medium term. So Kelly, if we could start with you, please. Um, you have an extraordinary and impressive biography. And as you reflect back on your time at Sloan, are you doing now 
uh, something similar or maybe identical to what you thought you were going to do when you were a student here? Yeah, good question. Um, well, hello to everyone and a special shout out to my classmates who are watching, joining us today. And uh, thank you, Dean Dave, to your team for putting together this panel. It's um, been great. Um, and, and I'm happy to join such great panelists. So um, answer to your question is no, not really. Um, <laughs> I'm not doing what I thought I'd be doing. Um, prior to attending Sloan, I was working with biotech and investors. Um, and it was one of my clients who suggested that I might benefit from the value of a business school education. Um, and my plan after Sloan was either to scale my business or to enter the corporate um, um, arena. And um, so I went to New York because who didn't think it was a great idea to go to New York in 2008 when the financial crisis was sending ripples throughout the, uh, the economy. Um, so the financial meltdown pretty much uh, eliminated opportunities for me at that time in the corporate sector. And uh, the decision was, it was obvious to me to continue with my, with my consulting business. Uh, since I was in the city, I accepted a random invitation to the United Nations and, um, and met someone who became a, a real partner for me in business. And because of meeting this amazing force and being open to um, a new opportunity and cultivating that relationship, I brought, brought my client base into an entirely new sector, which I never could have imagined being in. And that's um, with, with um, clients such as SAP and Google and Trotto and women in technology. So, you know, back to what you were saying in your opening uh, remarks is that, you know, adaptability, being open to change and you know, I know, I know most people probably uh, listening and participating in this panel are planners and have every minute of every day planned, um, overachievers. Um, but sometimes it's okay if, the, if you step back and make the space to be open to something new or if the universe throws you a curveball like a, you know, bad economy or a pandemic, you know, you know keep in mind that there's opportunity um, that might arise from this. Thank you, Kelly. Um, when you think about opportunity, so I'm going to turn to David, if I could, for the next question. Um, and it relates to um, a desire in any time of crisis, uh, maybe to try to um, pursue uh, opportunities that seem to have some security or safety associated with them. Um, and, uh, you know, can I ask you to talk a little bit about uh, your professional priorities and passions and um, how you thought about opportunity as you were choosing the path just after MIT Sloan. Yeah, no, I, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, echo Kelly's comments. Thanks for everyone putting this panel together. Um, and, you know, I'll be honest, it was really, it was really hard for me uh, in 07 when I started. You know, I gave up a job. Um, I had just bought a house uh, at the peak, wherever the top of the housing crisis was, that's where my house purchase was. Um, my wife wasn't working. We were recently married. And then I, I, you know, basically told her I'm going to business school. So, you know, she ended up finding a job for a nonprofit, making a nonprofit salary. I took out all loans and I really doubled down uh, on this investment. And so, you know, I definitely felt financial pressure. And I think that's something that, you know, a lot of people feel when they're going to business school. And, you know, at the same time, I, I had um, a technology background. I had a sales background. Um, Freddie and I shared that in common before we came to Sloan. Um, and, you know, I knew I wanted to start a company or I wanted to work in finance. So I was a career shifter of some degree. So that was going to make take some investment to do that. So business school was the right fit for me after talking with a lot of people. I did tracks in entrepreneurship and finance. I did, uh, uh, you know, really just focused on both those, those main areas. Um, and really just hoping to get a chance to, to see if I could maybe start a business. Uh, work with Michael Porter, Professor Porter at Harvard for a little bit. Um, kicking around an idea, start a business and, you know, realized it wasn't an area that I wanted to do it, but it gave me a lot of good education. And then I kind of realized, you know, I felt that pressure of, okay, uh, you know, I'm not going to have a, if I start to do a business, I won't have a salary for a couple of years. How am I going to pull this off? Um, so I started rethinking that and saying, okay, maybe I could do that a little bit later. I'll keep my eyes open for that, but I also need to make some investments in looking at what I want to do in, in finance. So I started, you know, that career path. Um, candidly, as someone who was switching, you know, I didn't have a lot of uh, experience with that. Uh, my classmates had CFAs, they had, they were going for the MBA. So I was sort of on the bottom of that list of uh, sort of eligible recruits, if you will. 
I had a lot of help from the second year who put me in charge of the Warren Buffett track. And so I got a lot more exposure, uh, had some great stories with dinner with Warren that I could share at a much later time. But, you know, inevitably I ended up finding the right fit um, at Goldman in private wealth. And you know, I took that summer internship. It was sort of a combination of, the, of both really entrepreneurship, trying to start a business inside of Goldman really allowed me to do it and, and marry that passion with finance where I could be kind of quantitative. Um, had a great experience, you know, did really well over the summer, loved Goldman, loved the people. I was all in um, and was just waiting for my offer and it never came. Uh, you know, and it, it, you know, usually would come one week later and it didn't come. And then, you know, a month went by and it didn't come and we were back on campus and I said, okay, well, maybe it's not coming, you know, and I did really well. I thought I'd get an internship, a full-time offer there. Um, so then I just started reaching back out again, you know, and I, I told my wife who wanted to be in DC, which is, which is where we are now, um, I said, hey, we may have to go someplace else. We may have to relocate for a couple of years. And, you know, I started looking at technology companies. Um, I started looking back into finance companies um, and, and starting those conversations over again. Uh, I, I felt fortunate uh, when the market dropped 777 points on October 1st back in 08, which was kind of a big deal back then. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot. But back then it was, but uh, I, got a, I got an offer to join, join Goldman. Uh, and even then, I, I, I jumped at the offer because it's what I wanted to do, but I still had that little hedge in the back of my mind. Of maybe this is not going to be the place that I thought it was, but, uh, you know, I kind of, uh, you know, put all my eggs in that basket and, and said, okay, I'm going to make this work. So um, that second year I started, you know, while I was on campus, I had that job. I started to go after a couple other passions just in case. And I said, well, you know, there are other things I have interest in. Um, and, you know, uh, I always wanted to serve on a board and, and do some, some more volunteering. So you know, I started to take some of those great opportunities to learn how to be a good board member, um, uh, which actually helped me quite a bit later on, too. Yeah. Um, and David, it sounds, I mean, it kind of highlights, um, uh, one thing is the role of um, your peers or colleagues uh, from the Sloan School, um, that, and, and also just, you know, sticking with it, and um, uh, sometimes it is, you know, chance as much as design, or a little bit of chance and a little bit of design, and um, um, and, and probably a fair amount of resilience, especially in your case. Uh, mm. uh, so let me turn to Frederick. Uh, Frederick, uh, you, uh, you started Okta in 2009 um, during the recession. Um, uh, I, I think many people would say that's a hard time to start a new venture. Um, uh, I think you were uh, uh, trying everything possible to get it going, including, including reaching out to students in the alumni network um, early on in the stages of building the company, recruiting and fundraising and so on. Um, so uh, could you give our uh, participants in this call a sense of um, you know, whether you think it's a good time or a bad time to start a company during a recession and um, you know, what would be some of the things that you'd encourage people to do similar to what you did uh, in making that happen? Yeah, of course, happy to do that. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Dave, and to the rest of the uh, group for putting together this panel. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, obviously, with uh, David and Kelly, and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with a lot of uh, my fellow Sloanies. So, um, you know, it is, uh, I know this panel is put together about talking about careers and how you can develop that during uncertain times. Certainly, I think we are in uh, what everyone can fairly call uncertain times today, both health-wise, uh, economically, uh, socially. So uh, it's certainly, I, I, uh, my heart goes out to all those who are graduating today or who graduated last year and who are thinking, you know, what am I graduating into? Um, for those of you uh, in, the, in the audience who are entrepreneurs uh, or who aspire to be entrepreneurs, uh, that means you are an entrepreneur, by the way, uh, this is a great time, uh, and I know that sounds kind of uh, weird, but if you look back uh, over the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years of technology entrepreneurship in particular, uh, whenever there are these, um, you know, whether it was the, uh, the tech bubble in 2000, 2001, where I had just entered the workforce a few years prior to that, whether it was the uh, Great Recession, as you talked about, uh, Dean Dave, where we started Okta, or now again, these are great opportunities to, to start new businesses and to think in new ways. Um, so certainly, I'll talk a little bit about that and then about the value and the power of the MIT Entrepreneurship Network as well, um, or the MIT Network, uh, the MIT Sloan Network in general. So uh, first of all, there's a lot of dislocation, obviously, that's happening right now in the economy. I mean, you can see it. There are not only in terms of uh, the shift in uh, jobs and where the jobs are coming from and where they'll be going to, but there's also entire industries that I think are going to be remade. And, you know, people have been talking for the last 
five, 10 years, many of the professors at MIT Sloan speak about this or write books about this very eloquently about this digital transformation that's taking place, which in my, in my, uh, in my simple brain is one of the most overused terms in the world. What it simply means is uh, businesses have to do a better job of interacting uh, online, on mobile apps with their customers, their partners, their vendors, their suppliers. This is gonna become more and more important uh, every day. And you see that happening. Uh, E-commerce has gone as a percentage of North American commerce from I think six to 16% over the last 10 years. Over the last four months, it's gone from 16% to 26%. So you just see the acceleration of what's happening in these different segments. And that means that there are gonna be some challenging times certainly for brick and mortar retail in the times ahead. At the same time, there are gonna be great applications, great pieces of infrastructure and technology that we are gonna think are essential. And we wondered how we ever lived without them just three or five years from now that don't exist today. And those are the types of opportunities that I think are, are out there and that, uh, you know, there is not a day that goes by that I don't have very uh, great conversations with very intelligent, aspiring entrepreneurs coming up with new pieces of technology or new ways of doing things that I think are gonna be uh, transformative. And so that's definitely something I, I encourage everyone to look into. Um, and then of course you have the backdrop of the MIT Sloan uh, community, which is phenomenal. As you mentioned briefly, I uh, think Dave, when we started Okta in 2009, uh, we had the opportunity of looking ahead and really uh, taking advantage of that and uh, getting some expert advice from not only folks who were recent grads, but even uh, folks who've been grads 10 or 20 years before. Um, for example, the, uh, the folks at HubSpot, Brian Haugen and Dharmesh Shah, who graduated just a couple years ahead of me, uh, were very helpful in thinking about how we put together our business plan, how we thought about financing, how we thought about going out there and building our first set of customers. Um, there are some great folks who graduated uh, 10 or 20 years ago, like Rich Wong at Excel Partners, who I was able to reach out to and talk to about uh, how I was thinking about venture capital. I even got a job uh, while I was at MIT Sloan with Mark Gorenberg, uh, who's been at MIT for a long time, who you know, uh, was, was great in giving me just mentorship and thinking about all these things. So what you have to do is you just have to be confident and reach out. These people are always willing, and I get a lot of requests myself. I'm always willing to respond. Uh, just think intelligently about how you can get help, how you can get advice, uh, specific pointed questions you might have, and obviously something that you can give back in that relationship. Uh, when you reach out to Kelly or David or anyone else, they'd love to hear from you, but if there's also something you can provide from your history or information or even things you just got from MIT Sloan in that conversation, it'll make it twice as powerful. Um, and, then, and then finally, you know, uh, one big part of going to MIT Sloan, I know that you are all uh, obviously very intelligent, very experienced, uh, excellent professionals, but also very resilient. And so this is a time where that resiliency really comes through. And, you know, there are going to be some bumps along the way, but there's some bumps along the way in life in general. And I think this is one of those opportunities where if you really uh, look at the, the, half, the glass half full and see some of those opportunities, there are going to be some great ways to build businesses in the years ahead. Thank you, Frederick. Can, can I ask, you know, you're someone I think of sometimes as, when, when I think of the adage, um, follow your passion. Um, can I ask you a follow-up about that? Because I, I think um, uh, as your um, uh, career or your um, leadership arc, if you want, has progressed, um, I think of you sometimes in that journey to follow your passion. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, that kind of fulfillment for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd be happy to. Um, and I know we had an opportunity to chat a little bit about this in the Dean's Innovation Series as well, uh, and I got some very good feedback on that. So, um, you know, I, I think when people, always, I get a lot of questions from entrepreneurs saying, hey, where do you think is a good opportunity for me to go build a company right now? What parts of the economy or what parts of the industry or what kinds of technologies? And that, that's a fine question. I've got no shortage of ideas. Um, so we can certainly talk about that. But I think that uh, what's really valuable is for folks to take a step back and think about what you really care about, what you're passionate about, what you wake up every morning mm -hmm. thinking about. Um, and it could be something directly related to uh, the, the, the career that you're in, or it could be something that's become more of a hobby over the years. But if you think about the, the focus on where your passion is and kind of what's gonna happen three, five, 10 years down the road, you know, you have to take your visionary hat and put it on and kind of see what's gonna happen. And the intersection of those two things is always, is, is in many cases, a recipe for success. If you're reading about technology innovation that's already happening in, in a Wired magazine or otherwise, you're probably too late. But if you think down the road about what's gonna happen next with whether it's telecommunications, whether it's uh, infrastructure, whether it's robotics, whether it's uh, the internet of things, whether it's 
cryptocurrency, whatever you care a lot about, there are going to be great opportunities down there. And if you really, because building businesses are hard, as many of you know, um, it goes in day in, day out. You have to go through it. We're uh, 12 years in, and I was much taller and better looking when we started this company. Uh, but you still have to wake up every day with that same passion. And to do that, you really have to find something you're going to be excited about for the long term. And I know that uh, a lot of my, my classmates have some very interesting passions. Many of them have pursued them very successfully. And I know that opportunity is out there for many. Thank you, Brendan. So I want to ask a couple more questions. First of Kelly, um, related to that, you know, time in um, 2008, 2009, and that um, uh, the way you looked at the opportunities and experienced opportunities coming out in a time of challenge. Um, Kelly, you came to MIT Sloan with a background and an expertise in communications. Um, can you talk about um, how perhaps that felt like an advantage to you at graduation, how you maybe thought of it as an advantage, um, and how you leveraged that kind of expertise in um, working through a tough job market? Well, um, I, I didn't really think of it as an, as an advantage, but little did I know at the time um, communications becomes a, um, an important uh, tool during economic downturns. It's, it's ever more important to communicate with your staff and with your customers. And then add to that a pandemic such as what we're having right now. And suddenly, you know, I'm seeing an uptick like I've never seen before in executives who are interested in, in solid communications, especially in social media. Um, while we've been sheltering in place, um, we've gone online in record numbers. Um, we're talking to each other in ways that we haven't talked um, to each other in the past. And, um, you know, as far as, it, as job hunting goes, this is really a great opportunity. You know, we're, we're, we're uh, think about the Zoom calls. We're actually in each other's homes. You know, we see where they live, sometimes where they sleep. And, you know, you develop real relationships. There's a little bit more time actually to connect. Um, and then you have the opportunity to talk with individuals. If you went to a conference, you, you know, almost never get an opportunity to speak with the um, panelists. Um, but when you're, on a, when you're on a small Zoom call, you can ask direct questions, you can follow up on LinkedIn. So I think it's, 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 um, you know, it's, um, it's a great thing. As far as um, leveraging it in the, in the market, I've seen in the last 10 years, executives put more emphasis on communications and seeing how it really positively affects the bottom line. Um, we, we know, we communicators know that it builds relationships, it facilitates innovation, um, it builds an effective team, and it, it really does contribute to the growth of the company um, and as, as well as ensuring transparency. So um, I'm in the right field right now, I feel. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> oh, there, there's, yes, yeah, please. sorry. There's, sure. Well, as far as that goes, Freddie wrote something um, in Business Insider recently about um, how, how crucial sales um, 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 principles can make anyone more successful in their jobs, no matter what it is. And I feel the same for communications. It's, it's essential to have good communications um, can take you far. And um, it's, it's uh, essential for the growth of a company. Yeah, so maybe, you know, as people are facing um, unplanned transitions in their careers or uh, coming out of MIT Sloan at a challenging time like now, um, I think of your experience in that way as a uh, maybe um, broadening the sense of what kinds of capabilities people really have um, that they can describe to um, employers or to other organizations um, because our graduates aren't only narrowly, uh, you know, what their major was or, um, you know, what particular course of study, um, but many of them do have um, expertise and the ability to, um, uh, to uh, persuade and sell and communicate and so on. And that's hugely important to companies, mm -hmm. just, as, just as you yeah. said. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I would just add in real quick, uh, Dean Dave, that the communication today is arguably more important than it's ever been. I've really seen a difference between those who can effectively and efficiently communicate, not only verbally, of course, but in written form um, mm -hmm. during this uh, COVID-19 uh, period where everyone's adjusting to this new dynamic or remote work world. Uh, in fact, I've spent a lot of time with uh, leadership at Okta and others in coming up with some ideas around how you can improve the written word. I think it's probably something that we were all great at 50 years ago, and then all of a sudden it's kind of declined as we've gotten into 
this staccato word, the world of sending, you know, uh, paraphrased emails. But I think the written word, word, word is going to become more and more important. And I think exactly what Kelly said is something I would highly encourage everyone to think about because that will set you apart, especially today in this job world, those who can communicate well and those who can't. Thanks. Great. Um, so maybe we can, uh, Dave, I'd like to ask you about the period um, just after uh, starting. Um, so, you know, as we discussed, you started at Goldman. Um, uh, you know, there was a crisis that was called the financial crisis for a pretty good reason. And so it, kind of an interesting time to be in that sector. Um, and so I'm wondering what the investment industry felt like um, at that time just after being its loan. And, um, you know, if you feel that the challenging economic climate, uh, either positively or negatively, made a difference to you in um, your developing at the company and, you um, uh, and, and how in your development, your experiences from MIT Sloan or your being from Sloan um, helped you in that regard. But it's that period, you know, after graduation and you're, you're trying to navigate your way within this firm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. A lot to unpack there. Um, I'll do it succinctly as I can. Um, I, I would say that, you know, as a communications TA back at Sloan, that helped me out quite a bit. Um, uh, to think about this, picking up on what Kelly said, but you know what was lacking in the post financial crisis in the financial industry was trust. And you know, as you know, someone who had a sales background, communication is is really about building that trust. Um, and so, you know, the the industry really didn't have it. There were big re regulatory changes that were changing the banks um, as we as we went when uh, and and try to rebuild and and solidify. And again, I joined after all this happened. Um, but when I talk to people, they certainly had something to say to me about, you know, what I had done, <laughs> certainly uh, with, with being now affiliated with a bank. Um, so trust was a big part of it. Um, you know, at the same time, the other big industry change that was happening was people were moving a little bit more away from active investing into passive investing. Uh, so that was another big industry change of, of sort of things that were, were going on at the time. So, you know, I had to build a business, get new clients. Uh, during a time when, you know, people were certainly lacking a little bit of trust in what was happening in the financial markets or specifically with banks itself. Um, the other thing that was interesting was that during that time, a, a large way that we got clients was that they would sell a business and they'd have new liquidity. So if it was a, if it was a uh, private client, um, they'd either IPO from their business or they'd have a transaction where they sold, you know, a family owned business. That really wasn't happening. Everything was kind of frozen for a long time. Um, and so that kind of liquidity just wasn't taking place. So it was definitely a challenging environment to sort of start these new relationships. So you had to be really long-term focused. Um, you know, we were helping people think about how they could get loans, just building relationships over the years uh, to get to know people. And it, it took time. Um, but, you know, through that communication, we were able to build trust and they were able to see a little bit more about me and learn me as a person and being able to trust me and trust me at my, my firm. Uh, at that time. So it definitely took me longer than I thought in the early years. But again, everything was, it was just an investment. And, and to answer that, that last uh, question around what about Sloan, that kind of uh, made me stand out. You know, I, I would say two things. The first thing would be that um, when I was at Sloan, we studied something called the Black Litterman model. This is a asset allocation model that was taught to basically everybody in sort of investments 101. Um, and uh, I know, Dean Dave, you talk about this all the time. You say, you know, Sloan is the uh, sort of modern, you know, home of sort of modern finance um, for the world. And, you know, Fisher Black and Bob Lerman both, you know, taught at Sloan. They both worked at Goldman. And when they came up with that model and they published it in the early 90s. And so everyone was really using this model. And so, you know, I felt really fortunate. I got a chance to talk to Bob Lerman when I was at Goldman about this model. <clears throat> and uh, you know, really kind of put two and two together and, and really use my you know, quantitative skills I learned, learned at Sloan and bring that to bear for my clients. And, you know, when I started talking to them about sort of the insides and outs of these models, I stopped getting questions about the model and they started to trust me a little bit more that I kind of knew what I was talking about. Um, this, so that was the first thing that, that kind of certainly helped me and I was able to stand on my two feet very proudly with that. I think the second thing is that, you know, even though the landscape was difficult, Freddie mentioned something I think is really important in that there were green shoots starting to come up from new sort of topics. You know, Bitcoin, blockchains just started happening right then. And it really happened after I left Sloan. Um, but impact investing, ESG, these were topics that were in sustainability. These were topics that were being discussed at Sloan back in 06, 07, 08. And it just started to make its way to the finance community. Social impact bonds are being created, private investments and impact investing. 
I took a course with uh, Richard Locke for Sustainability Lab. It was the first one uh, they had at the time. And uh, I took a course with uh, John Sturman for System Dynamics. And you know, Professor Sturman had, had done a lot of work with sort of, you know, his carbon bathtub model to kind of explain how systems work and what we needed to do to reverse some of these uh, big issues. And these are some of the things that I was kind of passionate about. And, you know, while I started to kind of, you know, talk to my clients about these initially in back in 2010, 11 and 12, you couldn't really get market returns on some of these investments. You were taking what we call concessionary returns or below market returns. Clients weren't super interested in that initially, um, but things started to change over time and started having more conversations about it. And I started to get involved with my own time uh, volunteering and I, I worked for a, um, uh, an incubator for social entrepreneurship in DC called Halcyon. And I felt very fortunate to get involved and work with early stage startups that were doing this thing. So I you know, can't really have to be an advisor to a lot of them while they were trying to make sort of good companies and do good at the same time and, and make profit for their investors. So uh, mm. I'm happy to say that, you know, certainly that's been able to get me closer to clients who care about this kind of thing, um, who sort of started allocating all of their family assets, all of their foundation assets towards this type of investing. Uh, and so that's been a, a big benefit for me. And, and really that started that Sloan. Thanks, David. Um, that great. also may help us do a little bit of transition from like um, 2009 to 2019, 20 and so on. Um, as we look at the way the world has changed and the way it looks today. And um, I thought, um, uh, Frederick, I, I would ask you about uh, a social impact division at Okta called Okta for Good. And, um, you know, it's a, maybe a little bit of a, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a bit in parallel with what David was just talking about. Um, can you talk about why that part of Okta is important to you, Frederick? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a social impact group called uh, Octa for Good, as you mentioned. There's a, an Octa for Good fund. There's an awesome executive director who we have who runs the team, and there's a, a whole host of folks uh, who focus on that at Octa. I mean, taking a step back and, and talking about what uh, David said, certainly when I was at MIT Sloan, there was a we were just starting to talk about ESG, uh, which is the importance of uh, making sure that when you're building a company like ours, that you're focusing on everything else that matters. So the environment, uh, social impacts, uh, how you're thinking about uh, the governance of the company uh, and all these kinds of things. We actually have just incidentally launched our uh, ESG initiatives uh, over the last uh, six months. They've been very well received, but it's very early days. So I think there's a lot to do there. With Okta for Good, um, you know, my, my co-founder and I have the approach that um, it's, it's great that we're gonna be creating a lot of uh, hopefully, that we are going to be creating a lot of shareholder and stakeholder value uh, in the years after we started Okta. But it was very important for us also that you got to remember that you're part of a community and you don't live in this little technology bubble. And so, um, you know, today we have offices, I think, in 12 or, or 15 countries around the world. And so those are all communities in which we work and we operate. And then, of course, we have a lot of folks who are distributed and didn't, before the COVID-19 pandemic, work in a headquarter or large office. So they were all distributed around the world geographically as well. And so when we started Okta, you know, I had done a little bit of uh, given a, some, some work in philanthropy uh, myself, just personally, me and my wife and our family. My co-founder had done the same, but we thought it was important to create that um, kind of social value at Okta of something that we did as part and parcel of, of kind of how we were and, and how we behaved. Um, I, I was fortunate. I, I worked at a company called Salesforce.com. I started there in 2002, when it was a pretty small company, about 150 people, Mark Benioff, the still CEO and founder, was really big on the 111 pledge, which is that we would donate 1% of our time, our equity, and our product to nonprofits. Um, since then, the pledge 1% actually has become a big initiative, which I'm very happy to say that Octa subscribes to as well. Um, but, but just beyond that, it really got me thinking more about, hey, there's a lot more that you should be doing than just going to work. I know, you know, folks like uh, David, and I'm sure Kelly as well, but I know David personally, because we talked about it even when we were in school together, had always done a lot of things in his community. I think it was Boys and Girls Club, if I wasn't, if I'm not mistaken, uh, even well before MIT Sloan. Um, and frankly, you know, when you're in your, the early part of your career, you might be kind of focused on what you have to do to uh, professionally at work and all these other kinds of things. So taking a step back and remembering that you're part of a bigger community is very important. So when we started Okta, we always had this vision, but of course, when you start a company, your goal is kind of to hit the next payroll and make sure that you're not bouncing paychecks. So that's what you focus on for a couple of years. In 2012, we started by saying we wanted to make the first grants to um, a, an organization called SF Gives, which is part of Tipping Point Community here in San Francisco, which is just the first coalition of technology organizations that were getting together to actually give money back to the community. 
And I remember at the time business was not going great. And some of my board members were like, Hey, that's nice and all that you want to give money away, but maybe you guys should like try and make this business work first. So we, we pushed it through despite ourselves and took a little bit of beating along the way. But as we, but I think it set a very good tone. It set a very good tone for the company early on. A lot of people who joined realized that you do have to give back to the communities that you're in. You're part of a much bigger community. It's not just what happens to you and the jobs that you create at, at your company, but it's also about how you interact with the communities in which you, you live and, and work and play. Um, as we went along, right before uh, we were fortunate enough to go public in April 2017, so as we were writing the S1 registration document in 2016, we actually set aside 300,000 shares of uh, Okta stock, and we set it aside for a new group we were starting called Okta for Good. And that's obviously a very good time to do that because just as about as you're trying to file a, a public registration document, everyone's feeling very good about themselves on the board, and they'll rubber stamp all sorts of things, including setting aside hundreds of thousands of shares for Okta for Good. At the same time, though, when we were going public, we were now going to be selling stock to these um, uh, buy side uh, investment firms, as David mentioned, who are on Wall Street, T. Rowe and Fidelity and all these other folks. And we wanted to make it very clear to them, hey, if you're buying Okta stock and you're investing in Okta, you should also know that we set aside this, these funds and we're going to continue to do this kind of investment because it's important. And I think that that's a very good time to make that kind of statement just because we had a lot of leverage. Since then, I've actually spent a lot of time with uh, other startups that are coming up to that S1 registration document, helping them think and strategize about how they can also put aside funds, because again, I think it's a big leverage and opportunity point. You don't want to miss that inflection point. And then finally, what's happened over the last three years is the, the mission of Octa for Good is we invest in uh, the people. So obviously our employees, when they want to give time back or they find specific initiatives they want to do, we invest in the communities in which we operate. We make sure that we're giving back to all those communities both in time, but also in money, in cash money, because that's very important to all these nonprofits today more than ever. And then finally, we try and not only give away technology products, which a lot of companies do, but actually help nonprofits use the products that we give them. The biggest problem for nonprofits is they don't have IT departments. So if you think that at Goldman Sachs, it's hard enough for you to implement a new product or solution, think about what it's like in a nonprofit where your, your IT team is much leaner than it would be at such a large organization. Um, it's gone well. Um, things have gone very well. Obviously, we've been fortunate. There's been uh, appreciation in the stock value, which has created a lot of value for Octa for Good and impacted the things we can do. We recently um, uh, said that we would pledge $10 million in cash over the next three years from Octa for Good to technology investments and product development in all these nonprofits. So we're helping with a bunch of forums, a bunch of professional services groups, but this is actually cash out the door, not just in-kind services. Um, and look, it doesn't make us special. There's a lot of other people doing this out there, but I just think it's the right thing to do. It's a good thing to do. And, uh, and, and frankly, it, it makes you realize that when you're building companies, it's not just about shareholder value, but the concept of stakeholder value is really growing up. I'm sure that David sees this a lot and Kelly as well in their businesses. The stakeholder value is about a lot more than just you and your employees and your customers and your partners. It's also about everyone else who's involved. And I think there's a lot of great things you can do uh, in and with and for your communities that really make a big difference. So uh, thank you for, for bringing that up. I'm glad I got an opportunity to chat about it. It's uh, very important to us that the head, the executive director uh, of the Octa for Good Fund and Vice President of Social Impact, Aaron Felter, reports to me directly. It's something that, that I founded and I think is very important and, and continue to work on very closely today. So. Thanks, Frederick. And it's also, you know, as we hope that people understand how the world is changing and that there is need as well as opportunity in that change. Um, I, I hope that uh, through you, uh, MIT uh, plays a positive role. And, um, and, and, and what I'd like to do next is to turn back a little bit more directly to, to MIT. And um, Kelly, um, to that point of uh, social impact and making the world better, you were involved in launching the MIT Innovation Initiative. Um, which really transformed the innovation ecosystem of MIT. Um, and I know that um, that provides economic opportunity, uh, but it also has a positive social impact. And in this period of pandemic, um, I wonder if you think about the MIT Innovation Initiative as, um, you know, it, as one of the legacies that you've left that um, is also making and needs to make a positive difference. Well, I'm, thanks for bringing that up. I've, I've given a lot of thought to the innovation initiative um, since COVID-19 um, has, has 
arisen. And um, but first, I just Freddie. Wow, uh, I'm so happy to hear what you're doing with Octa for Good. Um, it's great work. I've done a lot of work with nonprofits, and um, boy, you know, just sometimes the technology or lack thereof, and the working with skeleton crews who have just you know given so much to making things work, but they need that extra help, and and so. Uh, thank you for that. It's it's inspiring, and you know it actually it it it's it's what MIT is known for. Innovation in the service of society has been at the core of MIT since its founding over 150 years ago, and um, you know it's our philosophy of mind and hand. Um, with respect to COVID-19, uh, the community really stepped up. Um, from you know com combating feelings of isolation to open source ventilators and playing a key role in um, statewide um, personal protection uh, equipment. So you know MIT has really really been been you know at the forefront of of pitching in. Um, and um, the other thing is is I'm really proud of the fact that we this MIT has come up with a fund to help. Um, you know, th those in need during 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 this um, uh, pandemic. So with um, with the innovation initiative, it was really set out because students are really um, passionate and want to get out there and make a difference in the world. And so the innovation initiative was really set up as a as a way to help facilitate that. It was, um, you know, initially we looked at the, the classroom, you know, maybe lectures aren't the best use of time for when professors and students are together. Maybe it's better if students um, have the opportunity to work on their passion projects when they actually have the, the feedback from the from the professors and they can watch pre-recorded um, lectures at their in their dorm rooms on their free time. Um, and um, we found that actually there were a lot of people prior to the pandemic who were thinking about um, online learning um, and, and that really helped MIT respond quickly. Um, but there were a lot of people at MIT who just hadn't taught online either. And what was nice again to see the community come together and help the professors who were unaccustomed to that to get up and ramp up um, quickly. So I've been watching it very quickly or, or closely over the last couple of months and I'm very proud of our community. Um, but the other thing is, is that uh, it was such a pleasure to work with students on the innovation initiative because they're, they're really, they're, they want to make a difference in the world and the facilitation that is um, happening at MIT and the transformation of the ecosystem is, is really going to help them get, get to where they want to be. Thanks, Kelly. And thank for, thanks for all that you've done for MIT and for our student community. Um, so we want to open it up in just a minute or two um, to um, questions from the community. Uh, can I ask in kind of a lightning round um, sense? Um, so, you know, each of you have talked about um, uh, being engaged alumni and the alumni community um, is important to people who are looking for opportunities. Um, if you have a sentence or two that you'd offer as recommendations for alums, either to maintain their connection to the school or to use the alumni network productively, especially in a time like now. Um, uh, you know, uh, David, can I maybe start with you? Um, uh, you've been very engaged as an alum and um, either in terms of encouragement or, um, you know, um, advice. Um, what would you say to uh, people who are young graduates or just graduating now? Yeah, I would say reach out, reach out, reach out, and, and don't stop doing it. Um, you know, when, when you were on campus, you know, I think for the first semester, you had a full day dedicated to your career and, and finding your career path. Um, you know, you should take this as seriously. I mean, you've been making this huge investment in your network. Now's the time to, to keep making that investment, and it will pay dividends for you, not just six months from now, but these long-term dividends, not just from the relationships that you can see and, 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 and things are in your, in your industry, but candidly, really it's people outside your industry. Uh, that's, where, that's where the most interesting developments are because those are your blind spots. And so, um, you know, your own classmates are, are one slice of MIT Sloan. And then your region is another sort of vertical slice. I live in DC, so I know all the DC mm -hmm. alumni, but then that's it. And so I have a little bit of diversification. And then I know the Sloan people that are in my industry, but outside of that, there's so many amazing people out there. So my second piece of advice is attend conferences. Um, if you can carve out that time, there was a, there was a classmate of mine, he was um, uh, Justin Gouchard, he was on the board with us. 
And he made this, made, you know, really changed that clip in my head uh, when I was on the board with him. And he, he attends quite a bit of conferences. He takes a certain percentage and he says, I'm going to make a reinvestment in myself to just get out there and get more educated. I, like I mentioned, Bitcoin blockchain wasn't around, but these are technologies that are going to be fundamental. And so find out how you're going to do that. Um, and, and make that education. And Sloan does a pretty good job of that um, uh, through their conferences, through their through the reunions is a great way to do it. Um, and then lastly, I would say find a professor or two and stay connected. Um, you know, that, that's something I think is incredibly valuable um, uh, that, that people can do. And, uh, and I, I think it's something that's really easy and, and just keeps the network going. Thanks, David. Uh, Kelly, can I come back to you and ask if there's anything that you might like to um, um, add or say on, on this topic of connecting and using the alumni network? Oh, of course, you know, during an uncertain job market, your network becomes even more important. And, um, you know, reaching out to your classmates may feel really comfortable and an easy thing to do. But as David said, you know, we have a wider Sloan network and we should use it. You know, we're all in this together. We have a stake in each other. And um, I, I have some uh, great examples of my classmates. A few of my classmates actually used the infinite connection to reach out to individuals uh, who they didn't know. They just scoured a region that they wanted to work in or a sector that they wanted to work in. And, and those that did that actually landed some really good, interesting jobs, even despite the bad times of 2008. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out, actually, uh, Dean, Dave, uh, for putting more effort into the career development office. I know you elevated that office and you put more resources into it that then existed when we were there 10 years ago. So um, kudos on that, because that's an important um, addition as well. Well, let's pause on kudos. Kudos is a fantastic way <laughs> maybe to make a transition with apologies <laughs> to Frederick, but we have only a few more minutes to go. and. Um, I've got nothing to maybe. add, Dean Dave. They didn't leave me anything, so there you go. <laughs> well, um, so uh, those kudos for their doing um, as well as they did too. You know, Thanks, uh, everyone. So I think um, I can. Dean Dave may have some. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Jump in here. You know, we weren't the only ones that kind of started at Sloan around this time. I mean, I, specifically, you also started uh, yeah. career at Sloan around this time too, and so. You know, one of the things that's, that's really interesting, obviously, is you stepped in to have a leadership role during this crisis back in 2008, 2009. What were some of the things that you learned uh, back then um, as you stepped into this new role? Yeah, so, I mean, some things are kind of, anyone would have seen, you know, you need to protect cash, you need to focus on the few important things, uh, you need to build, in that case, very quickly, a leadership team you can trust and so on. Um, but the things that I learned about our community um, stayed with me for the longer terms. Um, Sloanies helping Sloanies is not just a phrase, um, it's real. And it was real during that time when people made sacrifices that um, disadvantaged themselves to help their friends if they thought that their friends would have a better chance to succeed in some particular setting. Um, that so much stayed with me. Um, the other thing that stayed with me from that time that I saw in our students is um, that um, a, a phrase that I've used sometimes, the ability to have the courage of well-founded convictions. Uh, and, you know, uh, when you were talking about the uh, portfolio models and the um, uh, valuing investments, you know, the ability to speak knowledgeably about a time of, yes, great challenge, but also great change and uncertainty um, is something that is really rare in the world. And people coming out of MIT Sloan are expected to be able to do it and are extraordinarily able to do it. And so a lot of what I learned during that time was really about the character of this community, both of faculty, staff, and students, um, and of alums, uh, to come back to the point we were making. Um, if you reach out, they will reach back. And um, it was a great set of stuff to learn. Uh, still learning it today. Thanks, David. Uh, so Lauren, do you have any questions for us, for them? I do. Thank you so much for asking. The first question, and I'll throw it out to any of the panelists who would like to answer, is, is now a good time to invest in ourselves financially, whether it's skills, learning new skills, or going back to school, or some other arena? And if so, why or why not? And anything you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to give a, a, a quick start to that. I mean, I think the answer is absolutely. I mean, not only is it always a good idea to reinvest in yourself, 
Um, but you know, as, as Dave said, we've all made big investments already in our careers and you need to keep that, uh, that ongoing investment going so that you can actually get some return out of that. But I think absolutely. I mean, an important thing, and, and I have, we have a, at Okta a lot of uh, uh, younger employees, some who are newer to the, to the job market, certainly many who uh, are new to their careers uh, over the last five, seven years. And they have not gone through, um, you know, some bumps in the road. Everything's been up and to the right. And so I think that when you go through these bumps in the road, which you will all the time, I mean, if you look historically over the last, whatever, 150 years since they've actually been tracking some sort of economic metrics on a national scale, even not even internationally, uh, you know, every seven, 10, 12 years, five years, there's something that happens. So and there, there's some bumps in the road. So I think these are good opportunities to really invest because what's gonna happen is we are gonna come out of this as well. When, everyone always asks me, well, when? It's like, well, I don't know. If I knew I'd be doing Dave's job, not doing my job um, and, uh, and investing on Wall Street. But um, uh, you know, whether it's in three, six, nine, 12 months, you know, depending on where you are internationally as well, it might come sooner, it might be a little bit later, it might come in different ways. We, we're gonna come out of this as well. And the combination of the, the health crisis plus the, the economic and social unrest makes it kind of like a double whammy right now, but we will come out of this. And when we do, I think the people who've invested right now and spent a lot of time on themselves and on whether it's learning the new skills, learning new industry, expanding their networks, as uh, Kelly said, using the infinite connection uh, or just getting to read more. I'm reading a lot more because, you know, there's like an hour and a half a day that I don't commute anymore. Um, so just learning new things and, and expanding what you can do I think is going to put people in a really good position when we come out of this to, to take advantage of the opportunities that are there. Great. Thanks so much, Frederick. This one's for Kelly. Given what you know now, 10 years later, what would you have done differently when you graduated from Sloan, if anything? <laughs> well, um, so uh, when we graduated, there were a bunch of weddings. Our classmates were all getting married and uh, they had weddings all over the world. I attended a few, but I didn't attend all of them. And I definitely would, if I had to do it over again, I would attend every single wedding. I would never miss an event or an opportunity to get together with my classmates and cultivate our relationships further. Um, and then I was uh, giving some thought um, the other day that um, 10 years ago, I wish I had placed heavier bets on Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. <laughs> but other than that, it was a, you know, I, I think I've made the right choices. I, I'm happy where I am. Great, thank you, Kelly. This question is for David. You mentioned learning about being a board member during your second year at Sloan. What did that look like for you and how have you applied those learnings? Yeah, it's a, it was a really exciting time. Um, a classmate of mine, Harpreet Singh, started um, with, with her work at Bridgespan, a Sloan Board Fellows program, where we basically, for, our, for part of our second year, we got to actually be on a board. Um, in Boston, I was on Jumpstart, Early Education mm -hmm. uh, Awareness, and great board. Um, I, I actually didn't know it, but I had actually participated in some of their stuff earlier anyway. Um, but it gave me an opportunity to see, truthfully, just how a board functioned. Um, you know, what was sort of strategic planning for the board, um, at that point, I was still pretty early in understanding sort of, you know, where we were with, you know, financial models, financial metrics, you know, profitability, um, but certainly setting a vision for, for a nonprofit organization was fantastic. Um, and it gave me an idea of, okay, how do you, you know, what, what is the responsibility of someone who's on a nonprofit board? Um, it, it's a little bit different, uh, and your role is a little bit different in, uh, in trying to fulfill the mission. So, um, it was something that my wife and I had felt pretty strongly about. Uh, we always knew this was going to be part of what we wanted to do long-term. So I wanted to make sure I got a little bit of education on it. That's great, thank you. And finally, a question for all three of you. Ultimately, do you think that graduating in uncertain times was an advantage or a disadvantage? This is probably from a current graduating student, so think carefully about your answer. <laughs> I'll go first and then, um, but I, I think it's, I can't really, I think it's always an advantage. Um, you know, you're going to be a little grittier, a little bit more resourceful, a little bit more resilient. Um, and, you know, truthfully, that's the kind of skill set you need to make sure you continually develop uh, as you grow your business. And, you know, if this is a tough time now, as your business, you know, as your career expands and grows, you'll always look back and say, well, it's not as hard as it was when I first started. So, you know, it got new challenges, but, you know, I made it through then. I didn't know what I was doing then. So, 
now it's it's a, it becomes a little bit easier because you may know slightly a bit more. Um, but there'll be new challenges that get that get put in front of you. But I, I certainly think I certainly find it to be an advantage um, if you're willing to bet in yourself long term. Well, I t I touched on it a little bit earlier. I think that this is a really unique opportunity to engage with people on a level that you probably wouldn't have otherwise. I mean, as Freddie mentioned, he has an extra hour and a half um, time to his day. So think about all the people who you're trying to connect with uh, and network with. Um, they too probably have a little more flexibility in their day. So maybe that's an opportunity to, to reach out and really, again, if you're job hunting, you, get that infinite connection, um, start, you know, working, working through, you know, lists, make, make a goal of, of reaching out to new people and old people every day so that you're fostering relationship and cultivating relationships at the same time. We have agreement from Freddie. Great. Thank you all so much. I'll turn it back over to Dave. Oh, Dave, you're on mute. Hey, yeah, bad, bad Dean mute. Um, uh, what would a Zoom call be without that? Uh, so um, if I could just um, say maybe two sentences in response to that last question also, and then wrap up. Uh, you know, I, I meet thoughtful alums of this school uh, who come from all different generations. Uh, but I have often in conversation with a particular alum from 2008, 2009, felt them to be especially thoughtful about themselves, about their choices, and about what MIT meant to their personal and professional development, maybe in some ways because those graduates had to be thoughtful about that. It was a very tough time. And, um, you know, what, what really matters and to what extent does this experience that you had at MIT play a part in that? And I certainly hope for recent graduates that you find the same in the time ahead. And I hope that you've also heard from our panelists that crises and opportunities continue and that MIT is a particularly great place to pursue opportunities. Um, I hope that these alums have not only been interesting, but that they have been inspiring to you. They are inspiring to me. And I'm very grateful for their giving us their time today. I hope that you all um, on this call continue also to invest in and be strengthened by the MIT Sloan community. It is a community in character that is unlike any other that I've ever seen. Um, and it's important for us as a school to invest in that community. And so I urge you as the panelists did uh, to find ways to draw on this community as you need in this time and other times. And if you're in a position to contribute to the community as well, uh, we need your time. We need your energy. The community needs your ideas. Um, and we also have a fund, the Immediate Needs and Emerging Opportunities Fund. Um, it's um, a part of the school's annual fund. And if you can contribute to those who are in need right now, both current and recent graduates, um, that is also a great way to strengthen this community. Because over the long term, we will all benefit from a really strong MIT Sloan community. Uh, with that, I wanna thank you all for making the time today. Um, and um, I hope that you and your families stay safe and well. Uh, and as was mentioned earlier, I hope that you'll continue to participate in uh, workshops and events and reunions and so on. Um, this is a great MIT Sloan community. And thank you all for the leadership roles that you play in it. And again, Kelly and David and Frederick, thank you for these thoughts and really great engagement this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, bye everybody. Bye everyone. Good luck graduates. <laughs>